Thank you, Deacon Witherspoon, for bringing forth Psalms 91 this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise, praise God. Good morning. Good morning. God bless you all. We are at the time of our worship service to receive the word from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, are we ready? Amen. Now, are you positioned to receive what God has for you today? Amen. Amen. I am. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honor to, to serve him and to serve you all today in continuing this uh, series in the power of words, talking about the power of words. And today's focus, we're going to be talking about using our words to edify. We'll be talking about using our words to edify, to minister. So last week, we transitioned in our Power of Words series to focus on how we should be using our words. And we, uh, we began our, our focus last week about, in, about teaching on the importance of speaking words of wisdom. And uh, last week, we defined what what godly wisdom is. And we said that godly wisdom is the skill of accurately applying spiritual truths to life situations. And when we say when someone does the opposite of that, they're being foolish. We call that foolishness, right? And we said we gain wisdom through the knowledge through the understanding and the application of Bible doctrine. That's how we gain wisdom. And seeking wisdom should be a part of our daily walk as disciples of Jesus Christ. We talked about the fear of God. We talked about having reference with God, respect through a correct relationship with Jesus Christ and how that is the beginning the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And then the last thing we talked about last Sunday, we saw that wisdom is a gift from God. He presents it to us, but it's up to us to receive that gift and apply that gift. Those, that gift is available just to those who are in covenant with him. Amen. And we have to seek the Lord with humility in sincerity church um, and, and a lot of times we limit because of that lack of humility and that lack of sincerity in our hearts we limit the ability to allow that gift of wisdom to be supplied to us and we looked uh, as an example of that we, we looked at Solomon in 1 Kings and we saw where he sincerely and with humility asked the Lord for wisdom and, and the Lord responded to him by supplying him with wisdom, an abundance of wisdom. And then we saw that, that Solomon took that wisdom that he had, that God had supplied him with, and he applied it in a life situation when he had two women coming to him about an infant child. Both of them were claiming that the child was theirs. We saw that last week. So today... We're going to be teaching on the importance of using our words to edify. And I tell you, praise team, thank you for using your words, lifting up the words of God through song to edify us this morning. Amen. Because it's, 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 putting, it's helping me be in position to receive what the Lord has for us to, uh, to be taught on today. So. We're going to touch on some major points with regards to using our words to edify. So we're going to, we're going to talk today about, we're going to provide a definition on what edification is. And then we're going to talk about how our words should be seasoned with grace and with salt. We're going to talk about how our words should be used to help and to heal not only ourselves, but our brothers and sisters. 
And then we're going to talk about how words, how words and how our actions, when they complement each other, are key for edification. And then we're going to close out in talking about how edification is linked to speaking the truth in love. So we're going to hit these five points and we're going to do like prime time did does. He's going to say, we're going to take it to the house. <laughs> All right. We're going to take it to the house. So the part one, we're going to talk about the definition of edification. So I know some of us, some of us have either been to Vegas or you've seen pictures of Vegas on TV or on your phone. One of the things that's become uh, an attraction in Vegas other than the casinos and the hotels and the shows and all that stuff is building demolition. Building demolition. There are people that actually drive in from hundreds of miles. They got people that fly into Vegas to witness the implosion of buildings. I mean, they make a big spectacle about it. They have this big celebration, you know, about this this event that's going to take place. They're tearing down one casino and hotel in order to erect a new one, a new hotel, a new casino. Um, and not only Vegas, but other cities have kind of taken this same approach to doing the same thing when it comes to building implosions. But it's kind of funny how people come up, you know, they, they, they come up with a way to twist the destruction nature that implosions, um, you know, the whole idea of implosions, they make it into this big celebration. And the uh, Holy Spirit said, you know, you know, Steve, he said, he said, when, when our lives are imploded, when our lives are imploded due to circumstances, uh, those things result in a loss of hope and a loss of uh, the hope in the people's dreams. Um, they, they end up impacting relationships. They end up affecting people's health. And uh, it's also it's a resulting loss. And there's a lot of sorrow that's involved in it, you know. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we, um, we talked about the destructive power of words. We talked about how, how words, if it, it sets off like a flame. And once that flame, sometimes if you don't deal with it, it can get to a point where it just consumes everything, everyone and everything around it. We've seen how these wildfires are impacting um, folks out on the West Coast, not only in Southern California, but they are in Northern California too. And we saw how, we talked about how this one fire, these fires can destroy things that took years and years and years to develop and construct. And so today we're not gonna we're not gonna focus on the destructive power. We talked about that already. We're gonna we're gonna talk today about how words can build, how words can empower, how words can deliver. And one process that we use in order to allow our words to create, to encourage, to build is the edification. And that word edification, people, you know, they want edification, what does that mean? Well, the Greek word for edification is okodomio, and I'll spell it for you. Okodomio, it's O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E-O. O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E-O. -O -E and that Greek word means to build up a person or persons through instructions or enlightenment for the purpose of spiritual growth. It means to build up a person or persons through instructions, 
or enlightenment for the purpose of spiritual growth. Pastor, we talked a little bit about this this morning in, in uh, Sunday school. Pastor Bradley talked about when you have spiritual growth, you know what you're doing? You're increasing your capacity of righteousness. You can increase in your, your godly wisdom to be able to discern what's of God and what's not of God. And so the script, our title scripture in Ephesians 4.29 talks about this. So we're going to go to our title scripture today. Ephesians 4, chapter 4, verse 29. When you get there, say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Praise God. Scripture says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word is good for edification in court, according to the need of the moment so that it will give, it will supply, that's grace, to those who hear. And if they hear it, they're going to hear it, they're going to have it, they're going to have faith, faith's going to receive that grace. Do we see how in this, this scripture, how edification is tied to communication? We edify one another. We edify ourselves by what we say, by how we say it, as well as what we do not say. Words matter greatly. I want to share something. How many times have we repeated something in our minds that someone said to us earlier that week? And we repeat it over and over and over and over. And that person may have said that word without even having any much thought about how it, how it impacted us or whether it affected us. But on our minds, we've, we've made that repeat of what they said grow into a monster. And we can't get rid of it. Words affect how we think, how we feel and how we act, church. I want to share something with you, and I want to give an example of how words can impact you. Um, words have an impact. There's a, if a doctor says to us, malignant or benign, that has an impact to us, doesn't it? If a judge says the words, guilty or not guilty it has an impact, doesn't it? Those words matter. Words affect our well-being because they are a linguistic reflection of realities of our belief systems and our thoughts. It's important for us to understand that. So how should our words be seasoned? Part two, we're gonna talk about how our words should be seasoned. So we're gonna to go to Colossians chapter four. We're gonna talk about how our words should be seasoned. Colossians four, we're gonna look at verse, start at verse five. When you get there, say, Jesus is lower. Jesus is Lord. All right. Paul starts off, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he says, walk in wisdom. He didn't say talk in wisdom. He didn't say doing wisdom. He said walk in wisdom. That, that it requires both speaking and doing together. He said toward them that are without Redeeming the time. It says, let your speech be always 
with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Paul talks about in verse 5, he begins with talk, talking about walking in wisdom. We talked about this last time, about walking in wisdom in our speech, in our actions. And we have to be mindful. He says, he talks about redeeming the time. So, so many people think they don't, they got plenty of time. Some people thought they were going to be here today. They didn't make it this week, church. We got to take every opportunity that's available to us and use it to the benefit of, of, of serving the Lord and, and, and fulfilling the calling that he has on our life. We, we're not promised tomorrow. He said toward them on that road that are without. Those folks that don't know the Lord, we have to use opportunities that God places, for, that God provides for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. There's going to be circumstances that's going to be coming in people's lives. And those are opportunities for us as disciples of Jesus Christ to impart godly wisdom into those people. Amen? And then he says, let your speech be always. You, you notice how the Lord used Paul to say, he used that word always to indicate how often our speech should be with grace and be seasoned with salt in order to respond properly to other folks. All right? I like how many of y'all like french fries? Mm -hmm. I like french fries. I enjoy a good french fry every now and then. I know french fries are friends of many of my, my folks in my house. So, to, but to me, when a french fry becomes a real french fry, is when they sprinkle a little salt on it. Okay. Yeah. You know, when it don't, it don't have salt on it, it's just like a regular potato, plain potato. But you put a little salt on it, oh, 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 it's a delicious treat. It's a delicious treat. Amen. That seasoned that salt changes the taste of that french fry into something that's just incredible and delicious. This is how the Lord wants our speech to be. To be seasoned with grace so that it can be transformed into something that's remarkable. God doesn't want our speech to be bland. And I don't, when I say bland, I don't mean people get, get caught up in trying to say, I gotta use certain words. I gotta be, I have to, I have to have this, this, this great vocabulary, speech, all these eloquent words and all of that kind of stuff. That's not what God is talking about season. He's talking about speaking from the heart that he placed into you. He's talking about speaking with the, the, those fruits of the spirit, speaking words of love, of patience, of faith, of kindness, of gentleness, of meekness, giving folks some mercy, just like he does for us, church. It's not about the type of words we use. It's about speaking from his heart that he's placed in us. All right? So just like cooking, seasoning, our speech must be intentional. All right? Food just doesn't get seasoned by mistake, right? It's properly done to add flavor for taste. All right? One of the shows that Lon and I like to watch is Master Chef. And they had these people come in and they had this competition and they cook different dishes and um, I find it interesting. But one of the things I notice as they're seasoning the food, one of the things they're doing, they're tasting it. They're tasting it to make sure that it's seasoned right, that it's got the right flavor to it. They're making an adjustments. The Lord wants our speech. He wants the words that we speak to be spiritually tasty. He wants it to be life-giving.
He wants us to, to make sure that it's given something to those that hear. Amen? And, and, and uh, back in the day, before they had refrigerators, right? Y'all, before they had refrigerators, what did they used to, what did they used to do? They used to use salt to preserve the food back in the day to keep it from spoiling, right? To prevent decay. What does decay do? It destroys things, right? It's important for us to use words that are flavored, that are seasoned spiritually to prevent decay in our homes, in our workplaces, in our churches, in our relationships, in our health. The key point we need to understand is this. If we're not preserving through what we say, we are contributing to its decay. Mm. Let me say that again. When we're not preserving through what we say, we are contributing to its decay. Sound like Jesse Jackson, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but this is the God. I'm preaching the gospel church. I want us to understand. God gives us the free will on how we use our words. Life or death. Those are only two options. Those are only two options. We got to ask ourselves when we're speaking to others, when we're speaking to ourselves, when we're trying to encourage ourselves during difficult times, when am I speaking to myself? Am I speaking things that's going to build me up? Am I speaking things that's going to bring me down and destroy me? The other thing about Salt Two Church is this. How we use salt has an impact on the taste, doesn't it? Right? Sometimes we can over-season stuff. Sometimes we can under-season stuff. You know? How we say things is just as important as what we say. Sometimes we can be too direct. Right? Not using tact in what we say. And sometimes, I'm going to go to the other side. Sometimes I can be too passive, right? And I can be compromising God's word in order to maintain a relationship. Amen? I believe in the world we live in today is full of this. We in one extreme to the other. Especially with all the social media. People... People believe it's okay to just say whatever they want to say. They don't realize the impact of the words that they're using and how it impacts the lives of others. And, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this: it's not only happening in the world; it's happening in the church. We we getting out of line with what the word said is about by using our mouths. And we're saying things in the church that's not building up to the church. It's, that's causing division. Last point about salt. Holy Spirit shared this with me. He said, Steve, you know what salt does? Salt makes you thirsty. I know y'all young folks like to use that term. Why are you so thirsty? I know y'all use that term today. I remember I used to, when I used to travel a lot, my, my manager was a part of the Delta, I think it's a medallion club. So if I traveled with her, I could go to, it was an exclusive place where you could go. You didn't, you didn't go with everybody else. It was the general population in the airport. You went to a special area and they, you know, they had TVs and you can have, you know, they had food and stuff like that. But one of the things, the first thing they ask you when you sit in there in the, uh, in the medallion club, they say, hey, would you like something to drink? I say, yeah, I'll take a grand apple juice. I'll take a ginger ale. So they, so they would bring out the drink. But you know what else they would bring? Pretzels. <laughs> what pretzels got in it? Salt. You know what that salt, you know the purpose marketing, marketing-wise, why they gave you that salt? 
so that you can ask for another drink. <laughs> <laughs> the more salt we consume, the more thirsty we become. The same thing happens when we season our speech, church. When our speech is seasoned with God's grace, when our speech is seasoned with God's mercy, when our grace is seasoned with God's love, people who truly receive the words that come from our hearts from the Lord, they're going to come back for some more. They're going to come back for some more. Because they need, some, folks need a lot. They need, in, the, in, in, in these days and time with all the tribulations and circumstances, people need a word of comfort. They need a word of peace that's going to help them get through these difficult times. And we have to be there. That's why God provided the church to be there to express these words, to minister to these people so that they can realize, they say, how, can, how are you able to do this? How are you able to maintain your peace in the midst of this storm you're dealing with? It wasn't me. It was the Lord. And the Lord loves me just as much as he loves you. And you can have it. It's available to you right now. That's what we're here to share with our brothers and sisters. When we allow the Holy Spirit to lead our speech church, he will supply us with wisdom to know how to respond to others when, they, when, when they're dealing with those delicate moments in life. Amen? So important. Let's talk about the importance of speaking words that help and heal. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 18. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. You there? Jesus, Lord. Praise God. Scripture says, there is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the, but the tongue of the wise is health. The tongue of the wise is health. It brings health. When you talk about health, that's some health, that's some healing that's associated with health. Amen. Sometimes people can be going through things, church, and, and, and they can be enduring a situation, they can be enduring a circumstance that can seem sometimes overwhelming. And sometimes it hits us. It's overwhelming to us. And you're like, oh, Lord, how is this person going to make it? <laughs> they're going to get through this difficult time. And when that happens, that should be an alarm for us to say, what does the word say? We have to, our words, when we edify, we have to speak words of faith. Words that tell the truth and not the facts, not the circumstance, but focus on the truth because facts are temporal but the word of God is eternal, church. You know, when I, when, I, when I have those moments, I go back to Romans 8 and 38 when it talks about, for I am persuaded. I say, I'm fully persuaded. That neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is no situation, church, that is so far gone that God cannot redeem it, church. As a pastor, Pastor Spradley, I know you, you, you've been here. We shared 
these roles as pastors, sometimes things get, as you're on your journey, you, you, you start to ask yourself, am I really making a difference sometimes? Are people really hearing what I'm saying? And it's funny because when you have those moments, that's when the Lord put a person in your life to, to, to give you a kind word, to an encouraging word, or you get a text from a, a, a member or a family member or a friend, a word of encouragement, or you hear somebody say, I prayed for you the other day, Pastor. And it's not, it's as if God, when, when you say those things, when I hear those things, it's even bigger than you saying. It's like God is saying it through you. And he's saying, Steve, keep pressing forward. Keep leaning on my grace. Keep, 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 keep staying, staying rooted and grounded in the word. Keep pressing toward the mark. I'm, I'm going to give you everything that you need. We all need that, church. We all need a word of encouragement to help us. We all need that church, it's important. That's why the Lord wants us to be vehicles of encouragement, all right? To encourage each other. Proverbs 25, 11 says this, a spoken word at the right time is like gold apples on a silver tray. It's valuable, woo! And this is why it's so important for us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, to always open our spiritual senses and allow the Holy Spirit to point to us for opportunities to give words of encouragement, to edify one another. Because you know what? The world ain't about building folks up. It's all about tearing folks down and beating you down we get enough of that, church. On our jobs, in these worldly systems, we get enough of that. When we come amongst each other, we, we should be in our workplaces, we should be trying to build folks up. Because we're constantly being destroyed every day with the systems that we're dealing with. So important. The enemy wants, all the enemy wants to do is steal, kill, and destroy. Don't let them do it to you. When you see things falling, that alarm should come on and say, hey, that's not what God has called. Hey, I'm not, it's not about, that's not what God wants in my life. That's not his will, plan, and purpose for my life. His will and purpose plan is for me to have life and to have a life that's abundant, that's full of those fruits of the spirit. Amen? Part four, the importance of edification with our words and our actions. The importance of edification through our words and actions. I'm going to say this. Our words of edif edification are only profitable as long as they're supported with a correspondence action. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Just being present for one another is something that's gotten lost in our world today. Just being present. And I'm not just talking about physically present. Because we can be present and be absent. We can be sitting right here, be present, but be told we're not engaged. I see it at home. I see it at the workplace. I see it here, in the church. Let me give you this example. I'm sitting here, I'm preaching the word of God to you. As the word, as God has given me the word to, to give to you. So in the middle of me doing that, I pick up my phone. I turn my phone on. I install 
answering some text messages, reading my emails in the middle of my sermon. I start checking what's on Twitter, what's, tr what's trending on Twitter. Who doesn't who done like me on Facebook? Check it, oh, fantasy football team. Oh, what, did, did I get my lineup started? Yeah, do I have all my right players in? How would you, how would you feel if I did that in the middle of a sermon? Said, That's not what you were supposed to be doing, Pastor. Your, your, your role is to preach the gospel, not, not to answer messages on the phone. I can't preach the gospel if I'm not present and I'm not engaged. You can't receive the word from God if you're not present, if you're not engaged. We see it happen all the time at home. We're at the table. What are we doing? We're there. We're present. But everybody's on their devices. Nobody's talking. Nobody's communicating with one another. We're at work. We're supposed to be in a meeting. They called us to be in a meeting. What are we doing? We're checking our, our email messages while the person is talking. I've been guilty. I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, not gonna say I ain't been guilty. I have, I'm guilty, I'm guilty of it. And that's why he corrects, he said, he said, Steve, it, he said edification involves more than what we say. He said it involves being present and engaged to listen and respond accordingly. He says, when we're in the presence of others, it's important that we put those other distractions away and give them our full attention. Because you know, he says, you know, you know what that does? It lets them know that we value them. We value them, we value their presence, we value their time. And it demonstrates to ourselves that we value the impact that we can have on their lives. Think about that. We value, it makes, it positions us to say, yeah, I'm listening because I believe that God has placed me here to have an impact, to serve, to serve them. But if I allow those distractions, I lose it. If I'm not engaged, I lose it. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. It talks about talks about this in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 23 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10. Are you there? Yes. He's talking about this is, this is believers he's talking about. He says, Scripture says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful, that promise. He says, let us hold fast. Let's, 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 let's not just say we believe. Let's, let's, let's show that we, who we believe in. Let's, let's, show, let's show folks who we are in Christ. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to what works? Not earn works, good works, good works that come from being in his plan. Amen? Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but doing what? Exhorting one another. And so the much more as you see the day approaching. Professing with our mouths and, and considering one another to provoke love unto good works. All right. So we're going to close out with how edification is linked to speaking the truth in love. One thing about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. A mature disciple is one who consistently is living their life under the influence of the Holy Spirit and under the, the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Spirit 
It's the agent, right? The transformation agent. The Holy Scriptures is the instrument of transformation. And this, having this spiritual truth, it gives us, it, give, it equips us, it gives us the ability, the power to edify others because we serve a Father who is full of love, He's full of mercy. He's full of grace. And this, this, this plan is available to any, any and everybody who chooses to be in covenant with him. And sometimes, and we forget sometimes, sometimes we tend to focus on telling people the truth and not balancing the truth with the love of God. They both go hand in hand, right? You think about uh, when the woman was caught in the act of adultery and they wanted to take her out. You know, Jesus said, you know, if, if anyone of y'all has seen, if, if anyone you have not seen, y'all cast the first stone. You know, he told them. And we saw after that, they, they started walking away. And then in the end, it was just a young lady, and it was Jesus. And he asked, he said, he said, have you seen anybody condemn you? He said, no, he said, I'm not gonna condemn you either. So he showed him mercy. But then he came back and gave him some truth. He said, go, and sin no more. You see the balance? That's a balance that comes there. They both go hand in hand and to be effective in ministering to others. We always, church, we're always, and we're gonna to go to the scripture, we're gonna to go to Ephesians, we're gonna go back to Ephesians 4. It, we're, it's, this is not just for pastors and evangelists and apostles and the five. We all are part of this five-fold ministry church. We're gonna to go to Ephesians 4, and we're gonna to go to verse 15. If you're discipling people, you're a teacher. So don't think that just because, I don't think the fivefold ministry is only for people that have serve offices in the church. If you're discipling others, you're part of that fivefold ministry. And Paul is speaking. He's talking about this fivefold ministry. And he's talking about the perfecting of the saints. And uh, if you look at it, he says, he says, and we'll start, at, uh, we'll start at verse 11. He said, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And he says that he, the reason why the, the Lord created this is for the perfecting of the saints, for the edification of the saints, for the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. See, we all come in the unity in faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue, stature of the fullness in Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, but the, by the slight of men and by cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Because they got some people that's that's putting some false doctrine out there. He wants us to be mature so that we can be able to discern it and, and to speak against it and, 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 and do it in a way that we're edifying one, the, the entire body of Christ. We gotta speak out. But when he says, he says but in 15, he says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things, which is the head, even Christ. When our speech contains truth, when our speech contains love, it is a reflection of who Jesus is. You know, I can, I can speak the truth to somebody and I can do it without love. But what kind of response am I going to get back when I do it like that? You know, without love attached to truth, people can respond negative. Now, I'm going to say this. 
when we're speaking the truth, and we're speaking it the truth to somebody, church, we have to rely totally on the Holy Spirit to give us the utterance, to speak what we have to say with love. So the person that receives it, understanding it, that it's coming from a loving heart, from a person that really cares and respects and is concerned about their well-being. Let it, one of the things is when we do is just letting folks know, hey, you're not in this by yourself. I didn't have to deal with this too. This is something that I had to deal with. I was delivered and you can be delivered too. But there's another aspect to it too. There's a receiving aspect of it. Because a lot of times people can receive stuff. People, you can say stuff with love. And we have to be careful ourselves as believers, as followers, when people try to bring us the truth and love. Because sometimes, you know what we want to do? We want to focus on the truth. And we don't, we, don't, we don't open our eyes to see the love that's associated with it. So we have to be, as, as speaking words, speaking the truth and love, and receiving the truth and love, we have, to, we have to be present. We have to be mindful. As we're receiving the truth and love, too, that we, that, we, that we look for the love that's behind the truth and not just focus on, well, they hurt my feelings by saying that, even though it was true. We have to be mindful. And we have to understand, church, that our speech is a ministry because it has the power to give grace to those who hear and receive it, church. Just as God supplies us with his manifold grace, he empowers us to deploy his grace in our relationships with our brothers and sisters. Now, I want us to skip down. Go back to our title scripture, Ephesians 4 and 29. It's we're right back where we started from. And I'm going to read this because I want us to see this part. I, wanna, I didn't read the entire, uh, I'm going I'm to read verse 29 through 31 because I want us to get this part. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And look at what verse 30, 30 says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, I'm going to keep it. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. When we choose not to speak God's truth and love, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And you know what happens when we grieve the hope of the Holy Spirit? It puts us outside of his operating plan. It puts us outside of his will, plan, and purpose for our lives. When we, when we choose to speak the truth in love, we edify others as well as ourselves, and we, we we, we maintain our, our position in operating in God's plan for us. So, church, as we begin a new week, as we start a new week, let's apply these principles of edification and let's see how the Lord responds to us. And let's see how others respond to us as well. Because I want us to understand our Heavenly Father is faithful. And the more we serve him by helping others, the more we will recognize his presence operating in our lives, more and more in our lives each and every day. Amen. May God bless you. And may his grace continue to supply you abundantly in Jesus' name. The door to church is open.